Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm Sarah Boris, and with me today is Jason Diaz, who we've had on the podcast before um, during the Colorado Resistance Reads chat, um, and Jennifer Araya, am I pronouncing that right? Okay. <laughs> um, who is his narrator for Finding Life on Mars, um, which is sort of a fun thing. We haven't had an audiobook narrator on before. Um, so we'll start uh, by chatting a little bit about your book, um, Finding Life on Mars, which is a sci-fi. Um, and for those who haven't tuned in to the previous chat, why don't you just sort of give us a little overview on that? Finding Life on Mars is a story about what happens if we don't do anything about climate change. Um, so, the, so the premise is post-apocalypse, Earth is tanked, and the last few people live on Mars. The last few people really in the universe live on Mars. Uh, but it's, it's, not a, uh, uh, it's not a Martian colony like you've seen on TV where everything's like clean and bright and shiny and works well. Uh, it is a failing Martian colony without support from Earth, uh, without material support from Earth. They just don't have the uh, fabrication capacity to keep themselves going. So the people there are already dealing with a slow motion existential crisis. And then it turns out there is one last person on Earth, but he's a homicidal maniac uh, who sort of speeds up the existential crisis. Um, so this is also a novel of, uh, of, of despair. Uh, uh, the premise being that, that hope without despair is really just optimism or wishful thinking. Like I, I hope that we do something about climate change. But if you're not doing anything actually really desperate uh, because you haven't engaged with the problem, then that's really just, just wishful thinking or optimism. Uh, and like then underneath all of that is the story of, of how neurodivergent people and neurotypical people might relate to one another. I love that, that addition, um, especially because you don't see that a lot in sci-fi worlds, for sure. Um, definitely more, but not, not nearly as much as we need to. Um, so narrating books is one of those like magical dream jobs, um, I feel like, sort of like voice acting. Um, so how did you, <laughs> how did you get started uh, performing audiobooks? And then how did you find uh, yes. Jason's work, you know, through that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, yes, I would absolutely agree that narrating audiobooks is 100% a dream job. I remember being a little kid, I've always been obsessed with audiobooks. I mean, even since I was a toddler. And um, I remember being a kid and listening to these people narrate these audiobooks and being like, that's the coolest job in the world. Like, that's even better than being an astronaut or being a president. But in my mind, it was kind of like equally difficult to become an audiobook narrator as it was to be an astronaut or president. You know, it's like after the age of five, you're not really seriously thinking that that's something that you're going to do with your life. And um, so I have always been involved in musical theater and music and plays and acting and all sorts of things. And that's what I went to college for. I went to Cincinnati Conservatory and um, majored in opera performance and cello performance. Oh, wow. So double major. And um, I, you know, did the classical music thing for a while and um, had a job where I was performing in the school system, but it was just a school year job and um, was looking for something to do one summer and just happened to Google audiobook narration kind of on a whim, not really thinking that I was gonna find anything and stumbled across ACX, which is Amazon's platform to connect friends, audiobook narrators with um, indie authors and realized that home studios were a thing because um, sort of the stereotypical thing for um, opera majors to do in college, like as your part-time college job is voiceover work. And so I did a lot of voiceover work in college, but it was always in studio or it was like a, a corporate you know, place would hire me to go to their, their office and record it. So I was not familiar with home studios until I kind of dove into this. Um, but yeah, I am now a full-time audiobook narrator doing just this and absolutely loving it, supporting my family with it. Like it's, it's 100% a dream. So yeah. <laughs> Couldn't be happier with my job, <laughs> very truly. <laughs> um, but in terms of how I found Jason's book, I was just searching through ACX. Um, when I initially got his book, I hadn't actually done a lot of sci-fi, but I love reading sci-fi. Mm. So I was wanting to look specifically for some sci-fi books to audition for um, so that I could expand my reach in that area because the publishers, you know, which sort of like pay a little bit more than the indie stuff, but 
the publishers won't hire you for a genre that you don't already have experience in. So I was specifically looking for some sci-fi books and I've actually since gotten quite a few. Okay. So Good. go that. But um, yeah, so I was specifically looking for some sci-fi books for and read the description for Finding Life on Mars. And sometimes when I read a book description, eh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll try it, see what I get. You know, most of the auditions I submit, I don't get. That's just the, the numbers game. But when I read Jason's, that was not the case. It absolutely clicked. I read his description and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to audition for this book. It sounds so good. I, um, as a reader, you know, like in my personal reading time, really connect with characters in, in a book. I mean, you know, the setting, the, the situation, whatever, I like to read about people. Mm -hmm. And um, even in the little excerpt audition blurb that he had, I felt like I was already connecting with the people. And so, yeah, no question that I wanted to audition for it and was thrilled when he chose me. So, yay. <laughs> It's always lovely when, you know, like you're, you're excited about a project and beyond just like, oh, this is, you know, this sounds cool, but just like, oh, this is, this is it. This is great. Um, I just had a similar experience trying to find my own audiobook narrator. Um, so that, that was kind of fun. Um, so oh, Jason, what, um, we, we talked a bit about, obviously your, your inspiration is, is what's going on in the world right now and um, sort of bringing a lot of that to light, but how does that translate for, for you into doing like the whole audiobook thing? Was that something you always wanted to incorporate um, just as like an, an, another platform or was there more going on? Well, uh, you know, in all honesty, there are just so many books that exist right now mm -hmm. that if you're just on Amazon, I mean, Amazon, there, there are literally 10 million books. And if people are just out there looking for something to read, your chances of getting discovered are really, really small. Mm -hmm. um, but AC, ACX and Audible are relatively new. It's a format more people are more people are going to, and we read. Uh, we we live these busy lives, and people are rather than reading books, listening to them in the car on their road trips, on the way to work, on 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 planes. Uh, and there are so many fewer titles uh, on there. That I was really hoping to just uh, 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 amp up that amp up that discoverability. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very lucky that Jennifer was out there looking for things to do uh, because I feel like I'm small time and you're big time. So oh. <laughs> I'm really grateful that you were, that you were oh. jumping on the spot for this one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really, to, as best of I can anyway, I mean, sometimes I can't be picky about what books I take, but as much as I can, I really try to be picky. And um, when I finished reading, because I always read the book all the way through first. And when I finished reading Finding Life on Mars, it was one of those situations where I couldn't wait to take it to the booth to read it again. Like I was excited to read it again. And um, to me, that's what I like about my job. <laughs> that's awesome. I, uh, I do like that um, the, I, I, I'm not sure how indie books necessarily fit into this. this is something I'm looking into as well, but that the Library of Congress has a service for people who are legally blind. Um, my, my grandmother was blind for the last years of her life and she was an avid reader before that. And um, they will send you audiobooks for free. And I, I'm sure there's some way you apply for it and whatnot, but I thought that was really neat, um, especially just trying to get stories mm -hmm. to the people who need to hear them, you know, even if they can't read. Um, and audiobooks are such a booming platform now. I'm I'm not auditory, so like I don't listen to audiobooks very often. I've, I've listened to some like in the car trips, you know, as a, as a child. But um, I just think it's so neat that there's this whole other platform that like I'm just sort of touching into now. <laughs> so it's really fascinating to sort of learn the ins and outs. Yeah, yeah. Audiobooks are the fastest growing segment of the publishing industry, both indie and traditional, and they have been on a sustained and sustainable growth curve for the past 10 years. It's incredible how much the audiobook industry has grown, and it's getting to the point now that um, listeners are very picky mm -hmm. in that if a, um, if a book is not available in their preferred format, so, you know, as Jason was saying, even if his book is on Amazon, if someone who's primarily an audiobook listener is searching Amazon for a new book, reads his description, likes it, thinks they would love it. If they see that there's not an audiobook, they're just going to go right on past that. Um, so, I mean, if you think of like BookBub subscribers, for example, the whole point of a BookBub is that the book is free or reduced price. Well, when people run BookBub ads, the audiobook of that related book always, always without fail takes a huge spike the audiobook hasn't been reduced in price. I mean, that shows you that mm -hmm. people want the book in their preferred format. And if audio is your preferred format, then that's what you're going to buy. And that's 
all you're going to buy. So having a book in audiobook it format is super, super smart for any indie publisher or indie author who's wanting to get their work out there. Um, and quick little side note, you mentioning that your grandmother was blind at the end of her life. One of my closest friends is blind, has been from birth. And um, she and I, once I started audiobook narrating, were talking about what audiobooks mean to her. Mm-hmm. And um, every time I think about what I do and why I do it, I, I always have to think back to her. Her name's Jennifer also. And Jennifer was telling me that um, it has been huge for her the past couple of years that she gets to read the new released books on the same day that everyone else does. Because it used to be, you know, even just five years ago, when a traditional publisher released a book, they would put out the print or the ebook at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then the audio sometimes wouldn't come out for a couple of years afterwards. So she'd be hearing all of her friends talking about this fabulous new book that they were reading and it was completely inaccessible to her. Um, But that's not the case anymore. And in fact, some publishers are even doing audio first releases where the audio book comes out about a month before the print. Um, So she's, you know, she's getting her format first and it's just so huge for her. Um, and yeah, she, she's one of my biggest fans. She gets copies of about every book I do. (laughs) That's so fantastic. And like having that connection there, like that little inspiration sometimes when the days aren't, you know, when the days are long, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's always good. Oh yeah. 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 (laughs) It's like, I've got to make it good because I know Jennifer's going to be listening to this in a couple of months. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, so there's a lot of nuances to writing marginalized characters and narrating marginalized characters, um, even when, you know, it's an own voices situation like, like with you, Jason. So what has been your biggest challenge as an author um, to writing a neurodivergent character? Oh, I think writing neurodivergent characters is the easiest thing in the world. That's awesome. Yeah. When, 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 you're, when you're writing in your own space, when you're writing in your own lane, I think that's the, that's the easiest thing. Uh, and the real challenge is, is writing diversity from other perspectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, justifiably, a lot of pressure on authors to be increasingly inclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, so how does, a, how does a straight, white, cisgender man write a black trans woman? Uh, this is uh, and and do and do justice to those characters. Uh, later this year, I'll be pitching a novel uh, e- exactly from the perspective of a of a black trans Haitian woman. I've had to do a lot of research, make sure that I uh, have a lot of friends in the community, um, and re- and really get a lot of uh, uh, readers from the various communities to make sure that that I'm doing justice to these perspectives. I wish I could just write uh, straight, white, cis uh, guys all the time. Um, I really don't, but f- but from the lazy perspective, right. I mean, that would just be, that would just be uh, super easy. I always find that there's um, a little bit of this push and pull with like how, how different everyone's experience is, um, you know, because everyone has a different lived experience, even if they fall under the same sort of umbrella terms. Um, you know, like when, when I write a character with anxiety or PTSD, it's always like, okay, well, well, this is my experience, but like, would this be that character's experience or would they have developed the same way based on their environment, especially in like, you know, a sci-fi or, or a fantasy world. Um, and I think that's kind of fun to explore in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard, but I think, I think you're right. Like I, I didn't realize I was writing, um, you know, neurodivergent characters until I looked at some other characters. I'm like, oh, well, I guess, other people, normal people, right, don't don't act like that or don't feel those things or feel them in the same way. And um, yeah, it's sort of an interesting, like, oh wait, no, this this is this is the character, this is who I am, and then sort of translating that. So that's cool. Um, so speaking of that, Jennifer, what did you do, um, and, and do you do the same thing for, for every uh, audiobook you narrate? What did you do to prepare for narrating Jay's character? And, um, you know, is, is there anything specific, or is, are there like tricks of the trade that you, that you do? So um, I always try to find some sort of reference recording that I can think of when I'm thinking of a character's voice. Um, and actually, I did this even just for the audition for Finding Life on Mars, um, because in the audition description, Jason, Jason mentioned that um, the character of Jay was somewhat autistic. Like, I don't remember exactly the way he phrased it. He didn't say she was autistic, but it's like, that's the kind of character that she is. And so I went on YouTube and 
listened to videos of people who are on the autism spectrum talking about their experience being on the autism spectrum and trying to communicate. And um, the ones that I really like, so whenever I have a book that I really want to do, if I find a really good reference recording during the audition process, I'll always save it just in case I get the book um, so that then I have it um, when I'm actually recording the book. And I found several recordings that I saved during the audition process that I then listened to again um, as I was actually recording the book since Jason picked me. And um, he also mentioned that some of the characters were similar to Data and Lal from the Next Gen Star Trek, which I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so it like totally, totally worked. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, and I had um, the entire time I was recording it, I had some of like the Star Trek um, on my computer. So if I was feeling like, wait a minute, I've, I've ventured into Jennifer Land, I'm not in the characters that Jason's written right now, then I could just pull up those pages and listen to a couple clips of Law talking and a couple clips of Data talking and be like, okay, I know where I am now. Um, you know, Sarah, you mentioned that you're not auditory at all. And I am very much a, you know, an auditory listener and auditory learner. So having those sample recordings is really, really helpful. Um, and also, like I said, there were just a lot of YouTube recordings of people who are on the autistic, autistic spectrum talking about what it means for them to communicate and the sort of idiosyncrasies that they see in their own communication and the, the speech pattern that they have um, and that it's kind of specific to their experience. And so as much as possible, I tried to recreate that and embody that while I was narrating his book. Hopefully awesome. I succeeded. <laughs> Um, now, sort of switching gears a little bit here, um, Jason, you have several short stories that, I mean, I've, I've been seeing you, you work on them on Facebook, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of them are in the sort of sci-fi um, horror genre. So what, um, what are you currently working on, and what's, um, what's in the works? I mean, you mentioned your, your one work in progress coming up that you're pitching. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your new projects. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've just wrapped a novel, and I'm in beta reads on a novel. Uh, about uh, what happens after the end of the zo zombie apocalypse. <laughs> it's called Waking the Dead. Uh, and the, the premise is that the sole survivor in the Denver area has a serum, and she has seven doses of the serum. Uh, so she has to sort of pick and choose seven people who she can reawaken from the zombie state. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a time crunch on it, because obviously people are falling apart, literally falling to pieces. And she has to pick and choose her sort of zombie survival team uh, before they decay to the point of not being recoverable. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's politics in, the, in that and people making bad choices. Um, you yeah. know, so that's, uh, so that's what's in betas right now. I want to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the to be read list is just like towering over here. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you, um, when, when you start out writing, um, just because I, I noticed you sort of oscillate between longer fiction and shorter fiction, um, do you know how long a piece is going to be when you start it, or do you just sort of like dive in and see where the story takes you? Yeah, I, ge I generally have in mind about how big a thing it's going to be. Uh, usually I start writing something because I have something to say. Mm -hmm. um, and feelings are complicated. I, I don't know how they are for, for humans, but for me, feelings, mm -hmm. feelings are really complicated. And uh, I know if it's going to take uh, 80 or 90,000 or 100,000 words to convey uh, uh, the, the, the feeling, the, the, the weird in-between emotion words, emotion that I'm feeling at the time. Like, how long is that going to take to capture? I'll usually have like a starting scene in mind. So here's the setting event. And I'll usually have an ending scene in mind. So here's the, the, the mic drop moment that we're going to get to in however many thousand words that is. Uh, when I started For Love of Their Children, it's an epic fantasy, uh, and I started that about four years ago. I had a scene in mind that it was going to take an entire novel uh, to set up the characters so that that scene could happen halfway through another novel. So it was about 200,000 words to get into that scene. And when that happened, it was very gratifying, actually. Do you write chronologically then, like like scene by scene? I doubt that's anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you have any plans to return to the Finding Life on Mars world and characters? 
that sort of um, that scenario um, at all or the, uh, there's a standalone novel called what hope wrought and that does feature some of the characters from the universe uh, the editor for Finding Life on Mars really wanted more of the scenes of what it was like to be on Earth uh, mm. during the during the crises points. Oh, okay. So, so what Hope wrought is those stories um, before the Martian mission. Okay. Also, there's a book of shorts. It is uh, uh, the end point of sentience, mm -hmm. and there's a story right at the end of that um, that that is that is at least in the universe. And, and peripheral. Uh, so, so at the end of Finding Life on Mars, there's kind of a teaser about where the story could possibly go in the future, mm -hmm. if I happen to be feeling like addressing that at some future nebulous point. <laughs> I'm about partway through, so I'm like, I want to know, because I, I enjoy the character so Most, much. <laughs> no spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> but obviously, obviously, if ten thousand people watch the podcast and bought the book, then that would really rise on my. <laughs> it's on you guys. You hear that? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> buy the book. Buy the audiobook. So Jason writes the sequel. <laughs> Definitely buy the audiobook. Definitely buy the audiobook. Um, that actually translates perfectly, sort of into my my little closing, um, which is where can people find the audiobook and. Um, when will it be released and where can people find you guys online? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I can go first. Yeah. Uh, so Finding Life on Mars releases on all places that you can get audiobooks. So iTunes and Amazon and so forth. Um, and search Finding Life on Mars by Jason Diaz, or you can search for me, Jennifer Jillariah. It'll come up both ways. And um, my website is www.jenniferjillariah.com. And I also have a super active Facebook page where I post updates of what I'm working on. I um, do some talks with authors that I've worked with and, you know, talking about the book and the process of narrating it and so forth. Um, so, yeah, check me out on Facebook. I'm, I mean, I'm on all the platforms, Twitter and Instagram. Right. Uh, real good. Uh, my website is jasondiasauthor.com. Uh, that's D-S-D-I-A-S, uh, the Portuguese rather than the Spanish variant on that one. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Edward Dias. Uh, also quite active on Facebook and uh, Goodreads. Hit me up on Goodreads. Uh, uh, review books on there. Have a good time. Yeah, so um, I'll definitely include all of the links to those things um, in, in the show notes and um, leave a comment to let us know if you listen to audiobooks and if that's your preferred uh, medium or if you're more of a, a paperback ebook person because uh, I'd love to see, see what you guys are doing. Um, and again, thank you guys for both joining me. Um, this was really fun. Hopefully we'll have more narrators on. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so... This has been the for having me. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, this has been the Amphibian Press Podcast, and this is Jason Diaz and Jill Araya. Thank you. Thanks again.